I made one of my little magics or else that was yeah. Mm -hmm. I think she changed the paper. Number four. Angela came in. Angel came in and changed it. Yeah, she's working. So put in these. Oh, that'd be yes. Sorry. The angel came in and gave her. Oh, okay. So. Put me right next to you when she did it. She was like, okay, she might see you do that. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. In West Valley, yeah. that it was yeah. going up. Interesting. Yeah. That's weird. But was yesterday an easier day? Today was more snow. Was it? I thought through West Valley yesterday was easy. Once I got to I fifteen, it was worse. But I didn't have to. It was easier yesterday. Okay. Or harder to say. Well, Harley's was bad. Got it. Not even good. But they stopped going east. Oh, did they? Yeah. 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 All right. We will call to order and welcome all to our study session meeting tonight. Um, meeting of the West Valley City Council. It is 4.30. April 4th, 2023, and we are in the multi-purpose room of West Valley City Hall. We have, we will excuse Councilman Fitzy Amanu and recognize that we have Councilman Nordfeld, Councilman Christensen, Councilman Whetstone, Councilman Harmon, Councilman Hoon at the, or at the desk with us, and our, assist, our city manager, that was last week, Mr. Pyle, and Ms. Kamek, our city recorder, is joining us virtually. We have the minutes of March 28th, 2023. Turn it to the council for discussion and a motion. March 28th. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And those pass. Um, I'll turn the time over to Mr. Pyle for any review of the agendas for tonight. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, there are no changes. Okay. So we're going to get to go as last week's study. All right. We'll now move to our public hearing, which is application ZT1-2023. And we'll turn the time over to Mr. Bunderson. Thank you, uh, Eric Bunderson, city attorney. Um, hoping the anticipation for this parking just made it better. Um, so parking is a complicated uh, subject and to reorient us, cause it's been a couple months, the council had asked that we increase the fines for repeat offenders. And um, so we drafted that ordinance. And while we were drafting that ordinance, uh, based on input from several departments, we decided to propose a couple more changes in addition to those, um, to, to just the fines. And um, the reason that we 
the reason that we wanted to propose those changes is because we are having some um, uh, enforcement issues in terms of figuring out what the weight of a certain vehicle was. The code originally had indicated that gross vehicle weight was the standard by which we would prohibit or allow certain vehicles, which is fine until you realize that in order to actually determine gross vehicle weight, you might have to take a vehicle to the scales to weigh it. And so it just didn't work that well. And so what we've proposed is that we prohibit or allow vehicles based on gross vehicle weight rating, which is which is just an, an easier, not, not perfect, but an easier thing to find. Um, you, can, you can say, um, for example, we prohibit all class four and higher uh, vehicles based on gross vehicle weight rating. And that's easy to look up when you go and you can see the uh, a vehicle, you can check a VIN and see what model is the gross vehicle weight rate. So then we made it more complicated um, by saying, okay, let's match on-street parking, which is enforced by parking um, enforcement through the police department with code enforcement under Title VII. So um, vehicles that you can park on your driveway. Let's have, let's have the definition be the same. And so um, that's a Title VII change. And so we took that through the Planning Commission. And here we are today in front of the council with the graduated fine structure and then the uh, proposed, uh, proposed codes, which, wherein we have said both in Title VII and in Title um, 22, which is the, is the street parking, um, that we would prohibit a gross vehicle weight rating of 14,000 pounds or more from being parked in the street or on the sidewalk. That number is based on, again, the vehicle class uh, rating that we talked about before, and that is changeable. The council wants to say uh, class three and above, class five and above, um, it's easily changeable. And frankly, between the two, uh, it, it makes it more confusing, but between the two, uh, parking on the street, parking on the driveway, also uh, you could change that. Um, the, the, our big concern is the being able to clearly explain it and enforce it um, going forward. The other thing uh, that we talked about is the motor home issue. And here, what we did, and I think we talked about this a couple months ago, is we created this affirmative defense. And affirmative defense is um, a legal concept that says you, you can't get charged or you can't, you can't get convicted, essentially, it, of the crime if you have this affirmative defense. And here we put, um, it's parked on the street, within 25 feet of the physical address uh, to which is legally registered or where the registered owner resides or is parked for less than seven days within 25 feet um, while the property is undergoing some kind of uh, improvements or is actively engaged in loading and unloading passengers. So that's where we're at uh, today with, with um, all of this parking stuff. And um, again, as, as staff, what we had recommended was the, the class three and above be allowed. That is um, gross vehicle weight rating of up to 14,000 pounds. Now, what is that in practice? Where's the PowerPoint? That is a car like this, car like this. That's a class two, actually. Not like this, that's a class four. So it's, if, if you think of it in terms of Ford, just for shorthand, it's an F350 and smaller. Um, if you wanna go with the class four, that's an F450 
and smaller. Any questions on that part? <laughs> Sir. At one point when we discussed this before, they said a, a tow truck would be overweight. But when we tried to ticket one across from me, he was underweight if he didn't have a car on the back. That's the old, that's under, that's exactly right. And that's under the old thing that we're trying to change because that's gross vehicle weight. Okay. I, I don't see a tow truck anywhere in the illustrations. But, yeah, and I am sorry about that. The tow, tow trucks obviously can be uh, built off of any kind of a, a frame as well. So they can be built off the, the F-350, the F-450, the F-550. My understanding is most of them are going to be in that F-550 they're, range. They're rollbacks, so they've got a lot of... Yeah, on yeah, start yeah. But, but even though there's not a picture of them here, um, they do have gross vehicle weight ratings that we can find. Okay. Yes, sir. And I'm sorry about that. I, that should have been one of the things that we put on there. No problem. You don't know everything I call them. <laughs> <laughs> so the printer, the sprint vans would be fine. Yep. Yeah. Those are, I think the class two is like this. Here. Yeah. Um, so if I have a tow truck, that's on a 350, it would be fine. Mm -hmm. And if we go up to 450s, a tow truck on a 450 would be mm -hmm. fine. Yep. So you said rollback. Does that mean the flatbed? That they yeah. pull the vehicle on, not just hook it up with the, yeah, pull it up. Okay. Just making sure I understand your lingo as well. Yeah, I didn't know what that Gary was. Gary gave me a, while you guys were on your field trip last week, I got an education on 450, 350, all those other weights and what was going on in the past that the code enforcement would have to, either the person would have to drive to a weigh station and weigh it to prove they weren't overweight which is a burden on the citizen I don't know that we want to do. And then it would be easier just to look and not have to look up the registration and see what the weight was. Right. So just to know by the classification made it a lot easier. It's, so go ahead. So, it's less perfect, but it's easier it to easier. for everyone to understand what the game is. Well, it'd be easier for the resident to not have to take it to a way station easier for the parking person to not have to look that up on every single one. I mean, I think we'd get more bang for our buck. Um, the box vans. Most of the, like like the U-Hauls, they, they come in different classes as well. Um, but the, the smaller ones, like the class threes allowed where the class fours, like these guys with the double axles would not be under the current. And is that if we went up to class four, well, then it would, it'd be like a 450 mm -hmm. and it would work. Yep. Yeah. Okay. If we kind of think again, in terms of the Ford chassis, the F, F450 or F350, that's easy. That's how and I think Chevy, they've got. Yeah. 3,500, 4,500. Equivalent type mm -hmm. numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Colleagues remind me, because I think I'm conflating two things here. So this is strictly talking about weight of vehicles we're talking about the weight wear and tear on the roads chilling on side on roads versus other conversations we've had about vehicles actually being obstructions and okay. folks not being able to reverse around or snow plows not being able to go through these are two separate questions we're talking about this is just about weight of vehicles not necessarily the fact that they're bigger vehicles that may be obstructions in the road right yes okay and then is this just for driveway parking, not for on street? Both. Is on street is the next? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. I I think we're, no, we're, we're, we can pair them so that they're the same. Yes. I'm talking about them together, but the first thing I'm talking about is the Title Seven, because that's the public hearing. That's parking on the driveway. On the driveway. Yeah, this is and, in your driveway, not on the street. Correct. Right? Yeah, because that's code, uh, like under the administrative code. Okay. Title seven. Yes. And then same exact conversation. I'm sure you'd love me to repeat it, but the same exact conversation for Title 22, which is the on-street parking that the police enforce through the parking enforcement program. Back to Title 7. Um, if they're behind a fence, are we going to enforce that? Let's say we have somebody that has a big RV that is a F-450. 
they're behind the fence. Seems like behind, in the backyard, yeah, or on a side yard, side yard behind or the back, fence. okay, or in the backyard. What, um, if it's a, it's a big RV, we've specifically accepted that Already. from here, yeah, yeah, because we, some people have those big buses, and I think that was the discussion early on that we wanted to. Allow. I just want to make sure is That's that right. on line 40? Is that where that starts? Uh, yes, 41. I got it up on the screen here. Okay. On 41. Perfect. Yeah. So why do we care if it's owned by the state or a local government we were talking as about opposed to a small business owner? Because we were talking about buses, I think, is why we wrote that in there. So if someone couldn't bring so their like bus. Right share UTA buses, something, something like, like that. that. Well, well, this says vehicles that are not included in the, correct? So you yeah, in the prohibition. Right. So these are these are the ones that are allowed. So you can bring the bus home during your break if you mm -hmm. drive for Granite. Yep, that was the that was the conversation that that we had. You don't have to leave it in the parking lot at Shopco yeah. anymore and go home and then come back. Yeah, I guess if you can fit it down the street. Um, School district <clears throat> considered state or local government. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it's a local government. Yeah, local government. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Like more videos. True. So up above it says no commercial vehicles, and then you've got some red line, and then it says shall be stored or parked for no longer than the three minutes loading and unloading. Mm -hmm. I thought we got rid of that, and it was twenty four hours for RVs. That's yep, because we carve the RVs out down here. Down here. Yeah. Okay, so. Yep. Why do we still have then the less than three minutes loading and unloading where they have 24 hours or are exempt? Well, I think that's this for is, this is their driveway, right? This yeah. is still just the driveway. Uh -huh. So, so no, this doesn't include RV. RVs. So non-commercial vehicles so, that are over yeah. class three can be parked in your driveway for loading three, and unloading for three, three minutes. minutes. Mm -hmm. Got to run home and grab your lunch, <laughs> or a tow truck, or a a big um, some some kind of construction vehicle that's unloading something or something like that. Okay, so this is still not on the street. This is just in your driveway. Correct. It says that uh, they can't be stored or parked for longer than three minutes, except while actually loading and unloading merchandise. So my furniture company can pull on my driveway, load and unload. Mm -hmm. But if they're in setting up my bed and it takes them a half hour before they go back out to the vehicle, because it's complicated, that one screw just won't go in. Three minutes doesn't seem like an appropriate time for my delivery mm -hmm. to be completed because installation is sometimes related to that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not comfortable with three minutes and then watching to make sure in that three minutes you've gone in and out, mm -hmm. especially for commercial deliveries. Could Does easily... anybody else see a problem? Yeah, I, I think she made a good point. Maybe they are she will. Well, anyway, yeah, the commercial yeah, delivery ones. Something like that. Maybe it should yeah. be more, more time for them to do. Yeah. My delivery may have been really complicated, but. Getting up the stairs and turning it sideways. Oh. We could do and then getting that one bolt in was literally I wasn't kidding. So that's why I'm thinking. I'm trying to think how long they were there. I think a three hour window would be more appropriate than three minutes. Just in case it's something weird. How do you enforce that, though? I mean, you can't expect people officers to, to wait around three hours. Well, they drive their route, so I'm probably sure they could go through. And if they think it's, I mean, honestly, if they just look and see if the back's open, but my guy left the back open, but others might not. That's another complication. Um, I don't know, but how do you get it? How do you get supplies delivered without a ticket? And then they don't want to deliver in West Valley anymore. And then you have to go pick up your own RC Willie or Lydiard or somebody else furniture. Because they're like, nope, our drivers have gotten too many tickets in your city. So you're worried that businesses will come in and they're not just dropping off, but they're also 
installing or or right. putting the things together. together. Right. Well, they yeah. have to leave their commercial vehicle in in my driveway, in which is driveway fine with me for that much time. For more than three minutes. <laughs> Just add the word installing or but how do you something put a, like that in there? But then they have to go knock on the door and say, are you really in there installing? You know what I mean? And that's a lot of yeah. effort where if they could just drive by, see it, and then if on their next drive by, it's been four hours and they see it, they're like, no, let's go talk to them, make sure they understand. Or, I mean, that's just another one I see being a problem. Yeah, two hours, good enough. I, I just see every person who got a ticket coming in and saying, well, I was inside installing. I don't know. Well, that's why you put a limit on that. Some of them can't. Get the last thing off and into the house and back in three minutes. Yeah. Even if they were just just dropping it off, <laughs> not even unboxing it or anything in the house. Yeah. Even, no, you should say even 30 minutes would be a little bit more flexible. I mean, it's just today I had a, a washer installed and it took at least 10 minutes. But the things will um my friends, he purchased like three beds. Yeah. And so that take more than, you know, it take about 45 minutes and a month. But he did recently, he did, did the three beds uh, for installation of everything. What we're trying to avoid is the homeowner right. bringing their commercial vehicle home and storing it. Right. on his driveway, even if he or she is willing to do that for more than 12 hours. Yeah, so for me, it, it takes out that whole time element. If we just specify here, when they're actively loading, unloading, installing, whatever that wordage is of actively yeah. using that vehicle installing merchandise. on the property. And if they're not, then they're out of compliance. If they are, then maybe you can take 45 minutes or even two hours. Or yeah, I just don't know how you double check that. Um, it's still <clears> easier <throat> than, than verifying time. Have you been here yeah. for three yeah. minutes or 30 minutes? Well, or maybe like a 12 hour period. You have one day that you can have it in your driveway. And then if it's another day, then no, because then you're coming home every day for work. I mean, if we're worried about time, then it's just. If it's there once, great. If it's there two or three days in a row, you know something's up. They're coming home from work and parking it. What if I it, like three hours, but if you want 12, we can go to 12. What if it's a contractor? I hire a guy to come put up a fence. He has a big 450. And it sits in my driveway for three days while he's doing a fence. It goes to Jake's point of if you're actively installing something, then that should be allowed, and he shouldn't get a ticket for being in my driver for three days. Do um, a guy repairing it. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's true, too. Maybe Maybe that's I don't think you leave it there. Take a home every night. At night, he would, but if parking comes around at 10 o'clock every morning, he's going to see a contractor's truck there. And well, that's when, to your point, I thought it would be easier and I, I'm not a code enforcement officer so I don't know but it feels like it would be easier to walk up and say hey bro what's going on oh yeah I'm installing this thing it's going to take two hours cool yeah. no further action needed you know rather than okay I'm going to start a clock I'm going to do this I'm going to come back in 12 hours I don't know that that's reasonable yeah and then <clears throat> excuse me I don't in our discussion last week, we were talking about, okay, so what if you're having your house remodeled and it takes three to four months? Those same big vehicles are going to come to your house every day. And Eric and I kind of talked about maybe when you get your building permit, being given five parking passes that are good for three months or six months 
probably three, and then you'd have to re-up if they're just really slow contractors. But they have to hang those in their window when they're at your property. I think it'd be a little cumbersome for home deliveries of furniture and that. But for a remodel or a new fence or something, you're going to have the same problem. Same vehicles for a couple months, and they're not going to be small. It took them almost three months to replace all the roof on the house. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they, they left every evening. Right. Came back every morning, and they were driving smaller vehicles, though, because they left all the heavy stuff, all the bricks and that were stacked already, and they needed to come back and install them. Right. But you're, yeah. And I don't know what HVAC guys and different guys drive. It does say in their last sentence of number one that that uh, this equipment can be there during actual construction. Oh, my 35. Maybe we add to construction repair and installation. I don't know. Yeah, I just think a three minute window is. I, I think an hour would be fine if you want to add a time frame in there. And then I think adding construction and installation down at the bottom, I think. The delivery and installer. Yeah, delivery and installation. I think if somebody gets a ticket, they could, I'm assuming, they would. They could bring in their ticket to show their their invoice for their dishwasher they got reinstalled and hopefully we'd be reasonable and, and use some common sense that they got it installed on that day that they got the ticket. Again, that's putting an undue burden on a contractor that's doing a service for our resident. I guess for me, it's still a, I'm not interested in them. I would rather just say no commercial vehicles shall be stored or parked period, except while actively loading, unloading, installing, construction. That just, for me, that gets rid of all the need for the rest of it. Then we don't have to have a time period. Yeah, because yeah. I don't think we can expect the code enforcement folks to be doing the time. No. If they can definitely verify if there's active construction or someone downstairs putting in, installing a bed. You know? Yeah. I don't, I don't think we should be tracking time on any of this. It's just me. I agree. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's okay. Am I doing my best, uh, Steve Pastrick, by the way? <laughs> Steve Pastrick yep. face where I'm just okay. So so what we're gonna do then, and and we'll do the same thing on 22. I think it's a little different, but it's it's essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. Is we're gonna eliminate the time and then we're gonna add down here at the bottom, except during actual construction, comma installation comma or maintenance mm -hmm. okay maybe it should be added earlier in the sentence with the loading or unloading okay because the last part is referring to like oh. contracting or earth moving yeah except what actually loading unloading merchandise installing repairing uh, simple actually installing, repairing, loading, or unloading merchandise. Yeah. Okay. With no time period. No time limit. We'll take the time limit away. Okay. So, does anybody have a preference to? You need to know whether class three, class four, class five. As it stands right now, okay. if you just let it go, it's class three and lighter. Okay. Class four and heavier is prohibited. Okay. So just because 450s are used to move a lot of boats, I would think a 450 and lower would be better than a 350. Not all 350s can handle all current toys on the marketplace. Anybody? I agree also because the more people moving in and out and mm -hmm. like a lot of times I mean, I've used that you haul before, right? With, um, yeah, that one bigger. <clears throat> okay, so we'll raise that 
um, gross vehicle weight rating to 16,000 pounds, which is a class four vehicle, an F-450. So now we're allowing large walk-ins, box trucks, and city delivery trucks. Is that right? That's what it would do, yeah. <clears throat> Is that also tow truck type things or a total different class? Again, depends on the, the tow truck's capacity, like the original chassis of the tow truck. If it's an F-450, which I don't think there's a lot of, but I'm not a tow truck expert. Again, if it's for active loading and loading and all that stuff, I think I'm less concerned. Well, this would be if they could bring it home and park it. So if you have a small business and you have a 450 that does whatever, no. It might be a small box truck. It might be a 450 truck. It might be. Okay. I, yeah. In the a pictures further on, the tow trucks I'm talking about are down in the other cities on it. They're in uh, that one there, the white one? Yeah. The okay. two white ones yeah. So I had another question. In the Planning Commission minutes, the Commission had asked for what other cities do. Yeah. And all I said in there is Miss um, Knapp explained it, but it didn't have the details in there so I could read what she, so do you have which cities do what? Yeah, that's what there she, we go, yeah, okay. And again, you sort of have, have this uh, hodgepodge of, uh, um, of enforcement. Uh, sometimes using the gross vehicle weight rating, sometimes using like Taylor's really uses unladen weight. And wait with the trailer, that one's really tough to determine. St. George just says axles. If you've got two axles in the back, that's a no. So I know that when my guy was doing the research for this, um, he put a lot of work into trying to make this uh, as enforceable. And again, the goal for both our residents to understand and our enforcement officers to understand. So I think he looked at a lot of these as he was preparing okay. this. Thank you. I just didn't go down far enough on the. I got stuck with your pictures of the first. <laughs> Sorry about that. And again, uh, credit to Miss Knapp and Steve Pastrick for putting the really good PowerPoint well, together. <clears throat> okay, and then was there? So the public hearing that we're having next week is just for. We're actually having it tonight. Title seven. Night. For the driveway, yeah. yeah. So the, that's two night. The the F four fifty, you're saying to, to people that need those to move their toys around and things. A lot of people use four fifties to. Yeah. So for if, if it's just to drive. a private vehicle, is that a commercial vehicle? No, no. Sometimes, sometimes they're both. Okay. I mean, truly. And we have a lot of small business owners here that I'm pretty sure we don't want to burden with not being able to bring their vehicle home. But do we want large walk-ins in our neighborhoods? In the driveway of the resident, not on the street, in the driveway. This yeah. Title Seven is just the driveway, right? Okay. Yeah. But we, I, I guess we do need to make that clear if we're gonna, if we're gonna allow one in the driveway and one in, in the street, make sure we know what which is which. Is which. Yeah. yeah, I'm more comfortable with the 350 and lower on the streets because I do think they're an obstruction and everything else, but then the others, and that's just, you know, <clears throat> what burden you want to put. I had a clarification question on the RVs. Okay. Can. So would you go back to the section on the time, the seven right days? Oh, seven. On this one, sir? That's on the next. On 22. I don't think 22, yeah. 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 I think, yeah, all right. Yeah, 22 is the next one. Uh, the 2I, A to the lie. Is parked for less than seven days within 25 feet of the physical address to which it is legally registered or where the registered owner resides? I think. In the main, this 
section works just fine. And I know a lot of discussion went into that. My concern is the phrase or where the registered owner resides. In most cases, that's going to work just fine because an owner will say, I don't want that RV in front of my house or, you know, there's some establishment of the relationship there especially if it's legally registered, which I think works great. But there are many instances we're running into where a friend of an RV has a relationship with the owner of the house. The registered owner of the RV then tells the officer out on the street, yeah, I reside here. And the guy in the house confirms it. And you can end up like this situation we just had a couple of weeks ago where the 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 one van that was kind of moving around a neighborhood went to another person's home. Our code enforcement officers were able to convince that owner that, yeah, this should not be there. And it's a little different because I think they were actually parked not on the property, not on the street. But I see the on the street thing happen quite often. Would we not have the same effect and therefore have the same ability for anybody who legitimately has a legally registered RV and it's theirs on the street, even if we just got the, or where the registered owner resides phrase, don't we have the same effect, even if we get rid of that phrase? We got rid of that. I, I think the reason that we added that in is, as we were talking about it, some people... Um... Mr. Pyle brought it up, that you might live here or have a residence here where it's registered, but you live here yeah. and you have it there, yeah. then that's why the two different. I think that's why we did. Yeah, it. that was your suggestion, by the way. I don't remember <laughs> this one, but, but that I makes know. sense. Yeah, it was you. That's, that's the situation that actually one. worked, right, yes. Yeah, and that's why we did it is because you can have more than one house. Day, the seven day exception, only if they're making improvements to their driveway. <clears throat> Oh, is it? Well, the, I, yeah, I, the I second one. saw the seven days if you know you're having somebody coming over and visit and they're staying. Yeah, with real you. property improvements, including structural, driveway, and landscaping install or repair. That's why you get the seven days. Oh, okay. Not just for not just, just for fun. No, that okay. was only 24 hours. Okay. You have 24 well, hours okay. with the same physical address, registered owner. Okay. If you have two different houses and two different whatevers. Mm -hmm. But this is just if you're doing improvements. Good catch, Lars. I didn't see that. I didn't read it fast enough. Me either. I got stuck at the semicolon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the driveways, and then we'll move on to this one if you have any more questions. Back to the, the walk-in vehicles. I mean, we're not restricted to just allowing or disallowing certain classes. We can actually ban certain types of vehicles, right? Good. Jordan only took like half of class three and yeah. other half of class three. So that's, I mean, we could still handle that and allow so we could say trucks, but not the walk in type. Of trucks. Nothing in class four except for pickup trucks. Sure. If that's what we wanted to do. So easily enforceable because that's just the visible. And that's right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but just so you know, that will restrict a lot of residents who have small businesses that take their vehicle to and from work. Right. We just have to draw the line somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're not going to allow them to put their big garbage trucks or. No, but class five takes it a step above. I think your class four, the lighter weight ones, are not as. Cumbersome as a 550. What do we use 550s for at the city? Because we do. Yeah, we do. A num number of different uses. Do we build a ambulance, ambulance on it? Yeah, ambulance boxes, I think, yeah. have 550s or four, they're 550s. I think we do some plowing with 550s. Right. Yeah. And there may be other ones I'm not remembering as well. And honestly, even a 550 pickup truck. If you own one of those, I don't have a problem with that if it's your personal truck. Because that's the other thing. You get to a 550 for your personal truck, but not the box trucks delivery or buckets or that large walk-in in class five. I just asked my daughter what size pickup she uses to tow her um, and I said, 
What's the size of your pickup? She said, bed size is 60. <laughs> Load size is a half ton. What do you need? Gross vehicle weight rating. Um, yeah, question mark. Yeah. I have no idea. It's a 1500, so it's a Dodge 1500 with a tow package. I can tow up to 10,000 pounds. But where would that be? That's probably so, yeah, that's a uh, class one or, or class two. Yeah. Yeah. Full size pickup is so your Ford Rangers, your Tacomas are class one, and then your F 150s are class two. Yeah. So that's a class two. It's actually 1500. It says it's, it's like a 150. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's Dodge 3500 nope. to get a class three. Mm -hmm. right. But when you go down the road, you will see boats that are pulled by trucks just smaller than a semi. No, mm -hmm. there are some towed by semis, <clears throat> but 450s. I think that would be fine splitting class four, separating those 450s without making it overly complicated. So just have 450 pickups? Yeah. It's just by weight, these other ones are already excluded in the current language anyways, right? I mean, all, technically all of them, so mm -hmm. you make an exception for pickup trucks. Yeah, and if you're gonna do that, I'd rather do pickups of 450 and 550, but no box, commercial vans, city delivery, landscape, walk-ins. Reasonable to me. So yeah, just uh, can't afford to gas. Just don't buy the car. Right. Allow pickup <laughs> trucks. My dad told me that when I turned sixteen. You what? So we just allow pickup yeah. trucks, whatever they are, three fifty, four fifty, five fifty. Yeah. 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 Anything else is. And so class three, the smaller walk-in city deliveries, okay. utility vans. I'm trying to think what our extended van was that we raised the kids with, it was huge. Okay, any more questions on this one? Okay, so. Right. Uh, the weight limit then will be 14,000 with the exception of 16,000 for or, or up to 19,500 for pickup trucks only. All right. That seems to be the fill of the council. Yeah. Are we understanding? Without a vote, but a nod of heads? Yeah, I can move with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Without mention of class, right? We're just talking about it. Okay, we'll, we'll use the weight rating rating to determine everything. Well, actually, we'll use the weight rating for everything. We'll use the weight rating for to prohibit and then to allow two distinct um, types of pickup truck only up to 19,500. Those pickups, no matter how many axles or if it's a dually or a whatever. Go off the weight rating. Rating, okay. okay. Basically same thing for Title 22, except in Title 22, my understanding is the council wants to keep it at the class three. So you only want class three and lighter parking on the road. So these kind of cars. Right, but I can't tell the difference between that truck and a 550. So I would still say the 450 and 550 without any just residential, no trailers on them, just the pickup by itself. Does anybody else have an opinion on that one? Sorry, can you say that again, ma'am? Okay, so a 350 and a 550 pretty much look like that truck there. As long as there's no Trailers attached or anything else, I'm fine with that on the street. But not if it's hauling, not if it's attached to a trailer. 
Because to me, just driving past, I mean, we've had a 350 dually and a 450 dually. And a, I've seen all four and three. And a, unless I look at the number on the side, I can't tell a 350 from a 550 dually. Dually's jackknife too easy, so we don't do those. I think it depends, it depends on what they how they outfit the 550, right? Because if if they're neither one are outfitted, they do look the same. Yeah. But you can put a lot longer bed on a 550. Well, a lot heavier equipment on a 550 than a 350. So the only bed you should have on any truck is an eight footer. <laughs> Four doors, eight foot bed, perfect truck. So, so Mr. Markham, you please stay in the seats. Thank you. So that's for a person, you know, just for a personal pickup truck. I would prefer none of them be on the street, but if they have to be, because what do we have about, um, trailers attached? to trucks on the street. We didn't add anything. Um, we have the 24 hours if it's a motor home type thing, you're loading or unloading. Mm -hmm. And then the seven days, if you've had to pull it out for landscaping or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay, but can I just bring home my lawn care trailer every night and park it there? Commercial vehicles include any motor vehicle or trailer or combination of motor vehicle or trailer with manufacturer's gross vehicle weight rating or gross combination weight rating of 14,000 pounds or more. So we'll still use that gross vehicle weight rating. On so the what do most trailer, how do you tell what a trailer will? Do you have so a trailer waiting or you just have the truck is 14? To, you go back to 31, line 31. So if a non-motorized vehicle includes trailers. Okay. Maybe park. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. No, no non-motorized vehicle may be parked, regardless of whether it's attached or unattached to a motor vehicle. Okay. So trailers need to be in your yard if you have it. That's my. Well, if you have your lawn care equipment, you better put it on the side yard behind a fence. Trailer. That's my understanding as well. We didn't do as much research into the trailers. I'm sorry, um, the commercial trailers and stuff. Well, that's just the one I get the most phone calls and complaints about. I mean, the length is one thing because right. if you have the, you know, your part, your truck's 23 feet. If you have the four doors and an eight foot bed mm -hmm. and then you put a even an eight foot trailer on that that takes the whole frontage driveway to driveway usually so yeah having their trailers in their driveway doesn't and off the streets yeah that sounds good Yeah, I think I think what we're getting at is with with the vehicle and the trailer together. If it's over fourteen thousand pounds gross vehicle weight rating, now to your question, I don't know how they measure the the trailer weight. I don't either. I've never seen it on any of our trailers. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if um, any of the parking. If uh, anybody in public works, people know that, or the public works. People. Well, and we can continue this tonight. So we could have you bring it back next week if we need to, just for that clear or email clarification, whatever the council wants to do that way. So the, the the question then is how are we enforcing the trailer? So so we've got the cars all settled, the trucks. On the driveway. Now the we're driveway. on the street. Now we're on the street. And the street we're saying. F-350 
And did we did we agree on the F450 and F550 on the road? And you know, this is common sense, I guess, but that's why we're doing this. Um, an F450 or an F550 with a factory bed. Oh, there you go. Maybe that's how we clarify that because you can get an F450 and F550 and have it upfitted for whatever you want to do. But that becomes more of a commercial type equipment. I don't know. Just a what if they get a custom bed that's smaller than the than the factory bed there. I don't know. But I want to be a, a, allowing the personal ownership of a vehicle yeah, as much as possible without also giving us an opportunity to enforce commercial vehicles on our streets. So I don't know how we do that. Trying as hard as we can. <laughs> you really are. If you think about it this way, the um, the way this is written right now, if you've got an F three fifty, anything that you're you have attached to the F three fifty would be overweight, would therefore be prohibited, and that's easy to even if it's a little tiny, you know, trailer, tiny trailer, because your F three fifty already maxes out the fourteen thousand. Um, gross vehicle weight rating. So anything above that, you wouldn't have to worry about the trailer. Yeah, it's just whether or not to let a personal 450 or 550 stay on the road instead of in your driveway. And how you carve those two out. Well, like we did, I guess, in the driveway, just say only pickups, 450 and 550, no box trucks, nothing else like that. And the reason and the goal was to make them uniform. Both and, ordinances and, mirror each other as much as possible so that it's less correct. Okay. And, less and, and less confusion about how to measure that. The, yeah. the, the, the real key for us was that gross vehicle weight rating as opposed to laden weight of a swallowing. <laughs> So on line 67, we're back to a three minute rule. And what is this? Because my lawn guy takes longer than three minutes to mow my lawn. Yeah, that, that exception on line 70 will take care of that, right? So we'll change line 70. Um, oh, so that's that's actually already closer to what we wanted yeah. in Title Seven, anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, can we get rid of the three-minute warning? Yeah, Is there a reason for that? Yeah. Because yeah, it would be the same as the previous ordinance, right? If we're talking about active use. I mean, if you can, if you can see that it's a lawn care truck and trailer parked in front of a house but you can't see them because they're in the backyard. I would hope that the parking people would have common sense to think, okay, they're there performing a service and then they'll be gone soon. Does that make sense? And I think they would know who owns the lawn care company if they're doing the rounds every, you know, I don't know what the schedule is. But whatever the schedule, they would know, okay, that guy is a problem. He owns it. It's in his driveway. We're good. Or he's over at the neighbors doing an actual job. So how, how that would read then is for purposes of this section, a vehicle shall be considered parked, even if the engine is running. Cross that out. unless the vehicle is actively loading or unloading as provided. 
and then it defines what loading and unloading means below. And we'll do the same thing, construction, repair, delivery, install. Mm -hmm. Then we'll take that yep, and put that back in seven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then did everybody look at the fines? They're good with those. Is that the other thing you need clarification on? I thought we agreed on that, but a long time ago. A long time ago. But okay. Yeah. Well, you just said I didn't know if this needed to be fixed or oh, not. No, yeah, it's, it's you're fine with that one. Yeah. Okay. If you guys are. All right. So I gave everyone a paper. Do you want to make consensus of what you want to do tonight? If you want to vote on it tonight, continue it tonight. Um, I just need to know if you want me to close the public hearing or leave it open to for more public comment next week. That was the stickler. That's on the comments. Good. No. I think I'm ready to vote. Okay. You're good with the with the changes that are be made? Changes. Yep. Maybe just in the motion, you could even, with the changes discussed in the study meeting, then I can, I can make sure all those changes get implemented. Okay. And you'll make those before Nicole asks me to sign for them, right? Absolutely. Because I'll probably send it out to everybody and make sure that it's understood before I say, yep, we'll sign it and be done. Is that good with everyone? Sure. What if you you put together before our regular meeting in an hour what those changes would be in an email so we can see them? I don't know. I can, I can try to do that. Yeah. Technology. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm good with just you, you know, making it and then we'll just all review it. Because I don't want to put pressure on you are doing like six jobs. In the resolution to discuss changes from the study session. And so that council is that that be the motion. Okay. So that I do. Okay. So I will we'll just vote on it tonight, not worry about the public hearing next week. Okay, perfect. Makes that easier for me. Okay, that's seven and twenty-two. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and seven was just the one that was going to be, if we didn't vote on it tonight, a little cumbersome, but everybody's good, we're good. Okay. Um, so here, ordinance 2310, not one, you're already done. So now we'll go to resolutions 2343, and we'll turn the time over to Mr. Wilson. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Mine's a lot easier. I just want you to accept some money. So um, we uh, we applied for some additional funding for our Crosstown Trail project uh, last fall, and WFRC recommended an additional $320,000 of TAP funding to be used on that project, which was approved by the Transportation Commission. So this is just a modification to the previously executed federal aid agreement to accept that additional funding. So. Okay, any questions? So was this because the price went up or they just gave us more money for the trail? Combination, um, the price went up, so we applied for some additional funding and they okay. they granted it. So the price going, yep. cost went up. Okay. Correct. Well, they in the meetings we've done it with for so many that uh, that's why I was wondering which way it was. So perfect. Okay. Okay, I don't see anything else. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we have the consent agenda, Mr. Pyle. Are these just normal? They all are normal, and they're all associated with the asphalt overlay plan uh, program for the year, except for the last one, 2351, okay. which is also a normal one, but that one's associated with the UTA project on 2700 West. It's about 139 square feet for a bus stop. Okay. This is the one that connects us to SLIC? Yes. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on any of these? Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to our communication items and we will welcome Mr. Dill from 
the Utah League of Cities and Towns, and he's going to give us a legislative follow-up or a follow-up of some sort. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. And, um, how much time would we plan on ten? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Well, that's what's, that's what's scheduled, Camp. Of course, whatever the council wants. Yep. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you for for having me back. I was here three months ago. It feels like three years ago because there was a legislative session in between. But uh, thank you for your participation within the league during our legislative efforts over this past session. I promised at that point that I'd come back, return and report about what happened during the session. But I also want to just thank you as a city and your team for your active involvement in our legislative efforts during the session. Your staff was regularly engaged in our daily meetings, our weekly strategy meetings, as well as staff and electeds being involved within our policy committee. I am going to take just five minutes of the 10 minutes to give you the quick overview. But then I also just want to hear from you about your perspective of the last three months and also quickly set the stage for what's to come because the legislative efforts, unfortunately, are never over. So there are really four general themes from a league perspective of the 2023 legislative session. Theme number one is we were pushing a message to legislators that was actually fairly well received, a partner not preempt. Partner with us to plan for growth. Don't preempt us as we try to plan for growth. And last week, I was at the National League of Cities Conference in Washington, D.C., meeting with state leagues from around the country, and I had multiple state league directors who approached me and said, what are you guys doing in Utah? Because we're getting preempted left and right on land use, and we're getting preempted left and right on housing issues. In fact, one league told me, one league director told me he was in a meeting with his speaker, and the speaker was unveiling a large preemption bill that would basically preempt the legislative authority of city councils, preempt your ability to zone in that state. And during the meeting, the speaker of that legislative assembly said, well, have you seen what they're doing in Utah? Because it seems to be working between local governments and state governments. So as painful at times as, as it is for us in our year rounds eff efforts um, around planning for growth, we have a much better story to tell than some of our counterparts in other states. When I was here three months ago, I wasn't 100% sure where the planning for growth conversation was going to end up. There were still very, there was still a lot of momentum back in January to preempt your ability as a city council to plan and zone. And ultimately we fought that off. We were successful at, at preventing that, that sort of preemption. Instead, we spent a lot of time focusing on how to improve the administrative land use process, both for the public side and the applicant, the private sector side, and raising the bar for both sides as part of the subdivision process which again, fundamentally different than the state stepping down and preempting your ability as city councils to plan and zone your community. The second, the second key theme is that we were pushing, or second key message that we were pushing to the legislature is that the state had a surplus, a record surplus, but cities don't. And to help drive that point home, we did an aggregate fiscal impact of every bill that could have negatively impacted cities and towns. And it maxed out, if all of those bills had passed in their initial format, at $118.5 million of unfunded mandates or negative impacts on cities and towns statewide, $118.5 million. Because of our collective advocacy efforts, we were successful at either simply killing a lot of those bills or neutralizing the fiscal impact. And so the ultimate fiscal impact of that of that universe of bills ended up being about a negative impact in the aggregate on cities, about 13 million. We, on top of that, were successful in really what I think is the second largest amount in my career of dedicated transportation funding for cities, where we were successful at, at modifying what was called the fifth fifth which was an already authorized county local option sales tax to include a dedicated portion for cities. And in the aggregate citywide or statewide for all cities, it would be about $44 million if counties impose that tax. In addition to that, we were successful at getting cities involved in what's called the road usage charge program, which is the long-term strategy for the state of Utah to supplement the motor fuel tax. Up until this session, cities and towns were not part of the road usage charge. Going forward, we will be. And that was an effort that we led to make sure we were at the table there, in addition to the active transportation dollars that the state invested in historic amounts. So all told, we went from 118 and a half million in an, in an aggregate negative fiscal impact on cities to ending up in the net positive to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars for cities uh, because of our collective efforts. 
for West Valley City specifically, if Salt Lake County were to impose that fifth fifth, that's a 0 0.20 sales tax, the West Valley City portion of that would be approximately $1.8 million. It would be tied to compliance with modern income housing plans and West Valley, uh, there's the reference to Steve Fastrick earlier, but I, I've read your modern income housing plan and, and between you as elected officials, your planning commission and your staff, you have one of the best modern income housing plans in the state. And so if and when Salt Lake County imposes that fifth fifth, again, I, we estimate about $1.8 million would flow annually to, to West Valley City. The third key theme of the session uh, was, actually before I leave the theme on the surplus, state surplus versus ours, we were also successful getting additional money for the homelessness mitigation fund. And we got money to help cities implement some of the housing bills that the legislature has passed. On the homelessness piece, when I was here three months ago, we talked about homelessness being a top priority for the city. And knowing that we're limited on time, I won't do a deep dive into what ultimately happened with House Bill 499. But I think the biggest takeaway for West Valley is one, West Valley is at the table with other cities in Salt Lake County working, working through the winter overflow plan for next year. But two, because of House Bill 499, what up until this past session was really a focus on Salt Lake County, Ogden City and St. George City, now also includes the counties of the first and second class. So Davis County and Utah County and the cities therein are also starting next year going to be part of the winter overflow plans. So that it's more of a regional and statewide effort and not concentrated in just certain particular areas. The, the third key theme, was the emphasis on, on rural Utah. The one thing I want to bring up to you, even though in West, West Valley uh, was rural when I was a kid, but it, it, it's not, not anymore, uh, is the local administrative advisor program that we successfully shepherded through the legislature. It's the first of its kind in the country. West Valley is blessed with tremendous staff. And I've worked with uh, staff members in West Valley my whole career, whether it's Eric in the city attorney's office or Wayne in a coal administration or elsewhere. But you may not, not know that two thirds of the cities and towns in Utah do not have full-time professional staff. So the goal of this local administrative advisor program is to part, have state resources partnering with the league and with associations of governments to provide local administrative advisors to these small communities to help them govern, to help them meet some of the, the state mandates around housing and other things, but also just to help them plan, to help them get in front of the growth that's coming, particularly for the small communities that are on the, the fringe of, of urban growth. So to us, that was a big deal. And that, that concept started with a conversation that I had with a mayor in a small town two years ago that we got across the finish line this year. And that leads to my fourth theme, which is the legislature really is year round. Yes, the session officially ended uh, four weeks ago, but we've already been in contact with state leaders who are laying out the priorities for next year. Next week, the Unified Economic Opportunity Commission, which is the governor's cabinet, the governor, the speaker, the president, a representative from the league, and a representative from the Association of Counties will have their first formal meeting of 2023's interim for the 2024 legislative session. So in this past session, we worked on 244 bills that impacted cities and towns. We worked on a bunch of different appropriations that help cities in a general sense, and the inks barely dry on those issues, and we're already starting into next year. Now, the one topic I didn't really hit on because it was a relatively quiet year on this front was public safety, but there will be considerable discussion this upcoming off season around the future of justice courts. We'll be actively involved in that, working closely with West Valley because of the investment your city's made in, in your justice court, justice court. And the other huge issue in public safety that again started with a conversation in April two years ago, I'm the chief, will remember this from the Chiefs of Police Conference um, a couple of years ago, was in April two years ago, the State Records Committee made their decision uh, around the around Garrity units. And we got a phone call that afternoon after the State Records Committee found against West Jordan City and Conwood Heights City. We immediately got to work on that. And that was, we successfully were able to modify uh, state law around those Garrity hearings uh, in order to, to protect all public employees, not just public safety employees. But that was a conversation that started in April that then passed uh, the legislature, legislature during the 2022 session. And so my, yes, this is a return and report, but it's also a request to you as the city that over the next few weeks, 
we want to hear from you. We want to know what your priorities are in any of these categories to make sure we can get them on the list, whether it's with the UEOC or legislative interim committees, so we can work together and, and get ready for, for 2024. So with that, Mayor, I'll, I'll pause, but I wanted to lay that foundation out for the council. Hey, okay, thank you. And thank you for all your good work. Anyone have any questions for Cam? Just a comment, I guess. I went to your moderate income housing workshop last week. Yeah, last week. And, and uh, which was a great workshop. And I was surprised to learn. So I agree. I think our moderate income housing plan for our city is pretty solid. Mm -hmm. If that were to ever shift and there was ex more expected out of it, I was, you know, I knew there was an appeal process um, implemented, but I was surprised to learn that, you know, if you appeal, that's it, you're, and, and you lose your appeal, um, there's no second appeal. Right. So you lose your, your ability to access those transportation funds. If, for that year. For that year. But I was, just surprised to hear that and maybe that's something that could be looked at in the future i think you don't even have an opportunity to cure or you, know, you do have an opportunity to cure so the way the timing will work out is well, like mayor do you mind if i oh, yeah, sure. question perfect so under the old law which is in effect right now west valley city submits the report and last year there were admittedly a lot of growing pains with how dws was interpreting plans. I know West Valley was caught in the crosshairs of some of those growing pains. Um, so last year there was the 90 day cure period. And I know that you as a city had to make a couple of minor technical changes in order to meet compliance, but there was no appeal process. It was just simply the cure process. So now there's both the cure process and the appeal process. So the appeal was actually added to the cure. Now you're right in that there's not there's not a second appeal after that that first appeal, but what we've seen over the last few months as cities were working through the cure process that was in the, the old law is that most cities were compliant with the spirit of the law, if not the letter of the law. And it was a matter of working through those growing pains with DWS and the letter of the law. Going forward, if we get to a point where there's still that dispute on the letter of the law, it'll go to that three-person appeals board, one of which comes directly from local governments, one comes from the private sector, and then one comes from the Association of Governments. Thank you for going to that, that training last week, and we'll be doing another one tomorrow on all of the other housing and land use bills. So were most of the cities able to correct their differences within the 90 days? Most, but not all, which I actually think means that the law was working. Ultimately, the intent of the Modern Income Housing Plan law a few years ago was to raise the bar for communities that weren't necessarily doing their part, but also not inadvertently penalize or punish the cities like West Valley that are doing their part. And I think as a result of that, inevitably, there are going to be some cities that are going to say, you know, no, we're not, we're just not going to do this. So one of the pieces that that was negotiated into the bill this year was that if you had a recalcitrant city that just said, you know, we're not going to do our part on this. Well, now they, in addition to not being eligible for the state transportation dollars, they're not eligible for the fifth, fifth money that I just described. That's new revenue that goes directly in your budget. And they would also pay a contribution to the Olean Walker Housing Fund, so it would contribute to housing in, in that way as well. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Well, Mayor, my, my last comment is this. In a couple of weeks, we'll be in sunny St. George for the mid-year conference, at least I certainly hope it'll be sunny uh, in, light of, in light of today's weather. I invite you to join us uh, for the mid-year conference. The cities of the first and second class will have their caucus meeting, and we use that conference really as an organizing tool to get feedback from the membership about priorities as we prepare for the interim. If you're unable to come to the mid-year conference, no worries. We'll follow up with, with the city over the next few weeks, again, as we start looking ahead to the legislative priorities, and if there are other things that we can do and other services we can provide to help the city. But we appreciate the partnership, appreciate your involvement in the league, and, and look forward to continuing that partnership in the months and years to come. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate all your hard work. Perfect. Great. Truly. Thank you. Man. Yeah, thank you. All right. Code enforcement discussion. Has everybody read through the 
email Ms. Cottle sent out last week of what was discussed on the previous. And was there any concerns before we go on? Just what I mentioned the last couple weeks ago about the demolition derbies. We could, you know, I love demolition derbies. <laughs> I don't know if we want a house with three cars sitting in the driveway, you know, all year. So if they want to put a car cover on them. I think that's probably keep them in the backyard or in the backyard. Okay. Just my, my thoughts. So, okay. so the note I've got here from Nicole, I'll probably ask some catch up questions since I wasn't there. Is recreational vehicles, including race cars and derby cars, are okay? So Scott's proposing modifying that to be if you have a car cover on it. Yeah. Okay. And in the backyard or side yard. Or the if it's in the backyard. Yeah. Which Whatever actually those. brings up one other question I had, which you may have discussed, and I just uh, couldn't tell from the notes, so I apologize for no, that. No problem. Um, and I'll, I'll use in opera vehicles as an example again. One of the things that I talked about early on with Lane from an understanding standpoint is we understand that you don't want us to enforce in the side yards and the backyards. My question to all of you, because it's not clear on this, is does that include side yards and backyards that abut public streets? Did you have that discussion? We did, and if there was a different standard for the public streets, it was considered a side yard now I got to figure out where that note is. So it, and it was the same question for whether it was inoperable or outside storage or or landscaping. And of course, the, right. the common sense question being, you can see it from a street from the front. Shouldn't or wouldn't you guys want the same standard to apply if you can see it from a street from the back or the side? Is that the intent? Mm -hmm. For the side yard, but that is a public street. Okay. I know it was on here somewhere. But I can't find yeah, it. I think the goal of all of our enforcement should be that as we drive through the city, as we have people visiting the city, that they see a beautiful city and don't see something John thinks somebody here. And yeah. sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say to the uh, problem that was brought up last week at study session um, this house they've been dealing with since 15 that has all the cars and the tires. <laughs> So what we have in place now obviously isn't working for that. And I don't know what to do to fix that because that is a health and safety. Oh, it might be. With a, Salt Lake County Health probably would not. Unless, are you talking about the guy who was the hoarder or the other lady? Both had tires and inoperable cars. So the reason I was asking about the hoarder is the one guy lived there and part of her complaint was what was inside the house. So oh. that obviously we're not going to have any we can't effect have any on that, effect right, right? Yeah. Yeah. and if it's in the backyard even there's been many situations over the year where i've been personally involved with where our definition of what's a health hazard is not what the definition of salt lake county health uh, um, is so there's some gray area there but through the to your real question yeah i mean i don't know really what the answer is both of those people that came last week said we're enforcing the ordinances just maybe not as often or quite as quickly as they would like, but we're doing it within the ordinances and the laws for sure. Okay. And um, so, yeah, so we said that situation. I think to solve those situations, we need to have something in there that if code enforcement goes back so many times and in so much time, then it's direct referral reports rather than going through the steps each time. Which we do already. And that was a point of possible rollback or disagreement as well. So right now, if you're deemed, I think it's within one year, is that correct? That you would go straight to the NOV process. That's not directly to court, but that's to the NOV process. Um, still from there. I mean, even as I'm reading the notes from the discussion from two weeks ago and 
I'm glad we got clarity. So I'm not trying to be um, difficult to the question, but in any event, even if you went to, well, let's just start it that way. From day one, courtesy notice, in any case, you're 80 days out from abatement if you ever went to uh, that level, if you had to go to that level. And of course, as we know, and we presented in the past, 70 to 80% of cases get resolved at the courtesy notice level anyway. So it's not a huge percentage, but it is a big or huge or possibly even close to 100% percentage of the of the properties that are problem properties like that like those two are talking about right so yeah almost no matter what you do from a, a process standpoint it's going to take a long time i understood them to say they they get to the where they have to clean up they clean up right and then go back and, and then, then we have to start right all over again at step one when they went back no that's not necessarily correct now sometimes they make that choice for whatever reason it might be, maybe there's a new owner there or they've worked with them in some other different capacity or maybe something's happened to the owner that that uh, changes the situation for that purpose. But even if it didn't, even if they do go directly to the NOB process, it's still gonna take a very, quite a long time uh, to get to some abatement point. And then even then, which the folks pointed out last week, even when we get to abatement, there are many properties out there that we've uh, abated multiple times and they still come back. So you're never going to get completely away from this. You can always change the personality of the person you're working with. Right. We have one, for example, right now that's in a, uh, one of the neighborhoods in town. We've been there multiple times. They have a um, sort of a, a, an abatement order right now outstanding, which we're not proceeding on as we were talking about this. We've abated them multiple times. They have uh, homeless uh, folks that they're either allowing to live on the property or they charge them some sort of minimal level of rent or they're friends of the owners. Um, they have drug traffic in there, in and out. We have... Uh, Multi multi agency effort there between COP and CPD, and um, until you literally have that entity own, from an ownership standpoint move out, you're always going to have that problem with some of those places. I don't think the two that the the couple and the other couple brought up last week quite go to that level of uh, madness, but we do have them. I mean, we've literally had some places where that level of situation um, existed, where the only solution ended up being that due to very various criminal charges, uh, level of fines and uh, liens that were on the property and those sorts of things, the, the owner and all the sort of hangers on that lived there moved out and we ended up in a situation where we were able to raise the structure from the property. To the midway? Oh, Midway is one of them. Yeah, and that's that's and that takes so much effort that you know that might happen once or twice or three times in the in the tenure that I've had. So I mean, just as an example of how actual recalcitrant or or stubborn a problem can be. Sometimes it's a family relationship problem where the person that's the owner literally doesn't want this stuff happening on their property, but they have no control over family members and family members, friends. And so we still end up trying to- You can't change the personality. Right, yeah, exactly. So anyway, I just say that from the standpoint of total sympathy with the two couples that came last week, but yeah, we're doing everything under the law that we possibly can do right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I might have gotten far afield from my side yard and rear question, but that <laughs> thank you for uh, yeah, it was on here somewhere. I just can't think for a second. Um, so I know we got to fences on our last discussion. I did have one thing after public comment. It did, it does, and it has made sense in the past. I've noticed in yards that they're on the surfacing, the um gravel, rock, whatever. I really do think there needs to be a distinguish of, like brushed rock is for driving on and landscape rock is not. 
Kara says, eh, just pick the landscape. And I know we weren't, we didn't have that clarification in our last discussion. Um, and less readily observable as parking or maneuvering area. It doesn't really specify that the two different gravels. And the house next to me, they do have crushed gravel where they park and then they have landscape gravel in with their landscaping or landscape rock, whatever. So I do think that maybe we need to clarify those two, that if you're gonna park on it, it's crushed. If it's, or whatever the proper word is, I'm not sure that crushed is it, but the jagged rock that compacts instead of just kind of washes away like the landscape. It's called road base. Well, there's crushed rock that has no dirt in it. <laughs> it's just. Well, we put it in the park, the trailer. Trailer. Yeah. You never had the park. You don't want that little box on the top. It's still. Yeah. And if it was crushed rock, it would drain even better. It but so anyway, did anybody else have an opinion with that after I think looking at this? Rock and the gravel put in the last time we redid it are two different species. Landscape and yeah. And here just we need to clarify whether it's landscape or landscape or whether it's crushed rock non-landscape. Yeah, just in here it just doesn't. It just says is assumed as landscaping unless you're parking on it. And so I don't think it would hurt to have a distinguished or the. I just, sure. I think it's subject to interpretation. I mean, Do you? Yeah. Okay. I mean, somebody could say oh, that's my landscaping wrong. And, you know, I, I don't know. I. I I think it's easier for code enforcement to say well, that's rock. That's not rock. <laughs> then to decide what kind of rock it is. That's my thought. Okay. What are we trying to accomplish by specifying this? Um, just to distinguish where you're going to park and where your landscaping is. So that one day, this rock over here is your landscaping and this is your driveway. Next and then the next day, it's first. this is your landscaping, and that's your parking. And the house next to me, I don't know if they checked with the city or what, but they do have their crushed rock and then a divider, like a two by four or whatever, and then their landscaping rock. And yes, there are plants in with their landscaping, but there's another house down the road that they don't have distinguished landscaping and parking. It's just kind of so all the same. What if people use rock that, I don't know what it's called, that people might use for parking, but they use it in their landscaping. Would we have trouble with that? Probably not. So that's a good point. Yeah. So maybe I'm overthinking it. I just thought it'd be, after public comment, I just thought that was an idea. Picture of it. Say that again. Think what it would look like if you were driving by and took a picture of it. Would it look all right or would it be out of place? Because that's what the yeah. code enforcement officer has to do. Well, and I guess to that, the landscape rock, if you park on it, kind of just sinks. It's almost, I don't know, it just sinks. It's like sand, walking through sand. Where the crushed rock, it sets and it's firm. So if you park on it, it doesn't usually, and you're supposed to have like four inches. It doesn't go down into the soil as easily as the landscape rock. It's just a better surface. But I've walked on both. Crushed is easier to walk on, park on and everything. But that's just one to think about if you wanna look at them and see if you think that's a problem or not. We try to prescribe every jot and tittle. We will end up with so much that they don't enforce. Okay. It's, it's easier to ignore it because there's so many subdivisions and sub things that it could be than it is to enforce. Okay. All right.
So our next one, our fences, we were good with, I think. There was only one oh. note I had on the fences and that's one that Nicole put down that was to continue discussion on color of graffiti coverage or removal. Yeah. Yeah. You never match a color, and it's a, especially if it's a block fence, solid fence. You end up, with, you can almost read the graffiti just from the shape of the patch they put over to paint it out. Yeah. I think we leave it as maintained with similar material and color. And Hopefully there's some common sense. Well, in with, our with or without a notice, you know, if it's reasonable, then we let it go. If it's not, then we I know there was a former city employee that lived in our neighborhood. He's since moved back to the islands, I think. But when his older son was caught with a spray can in front of a artistic thing. He was here the next day with a scrub brush in front of that same artist. <laughs> so was that a cinder block? Uh-huh. So I thought cinder block, you could only really get it off by sandblasting or painting over it. He got it off by his scrub brush. He was the sandblaster? Okay, uh, with the scrubbing? Was, um, his dad was standing over him the whole time. <laughs> I'm not as concerned about the color just because most of the victims of graffiti come to the our facility and get free paint. They do. So I don't know if we're given that paint or if we buy that paint. We we give them that paint. But we're do given we we're given paint it? quite often. Okay. And that's why you basically have three colors, because what they do is they combine them in whatever you know, lots they get, and then they end up with like gray and maybe some of them are cream and some of them are darker. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the three colors, yeah. gray, cream, and dark. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess my problem is, is penalizing the victim of a, yeah. by telling them that's the wrong color, right. Right. go buy your own instead of what we give you for free. And that's why well, actual color kind of, they have to get it taken care of. They have to go find the paint. They have and to paint it. Paint. Yeah. Yeah. Why do it? Yeah. Jake does work with them too. There are other solutions. Like if it's a vinyl fence, we have wipes, and yeah. acetone based kind of products, stuff that can remove. Great he food. does try to, you know, give them instruction and tips for what's the easiest way, what's going to look best, that sort of thing as, as he can yeah. and as they're willing to accept. Yeah. And on the slats in your vinyl or in your chain link fence, that it comes off really good with the wipes. If you use the right wipes in the right order, it's beautiful. And the sooner you do it, yes. the easier it comes off. Yeah, right you do it same day. Or, but yeah, the painting, not everybody has a sandblaster. And so I think to penalize them for the color of the paint when they're covering up graffiti. Now, if they're painting it from scratch, yeah. But when it's graffiti, I don't want to penalize just for a little shade different. But what are your feelings on that one? <clears throat> I didn't want to penalize, but that's what it up. Yeah, okay. So we're good with the color selection and however that all rolls out as stance. Yeah. Okay. That one, that one. Hey, too many garage cells. I don't think we saw really much change here uh, or complaint from, a, you know, we're not doing it well other than possibly frequency and we don't have enough covers of it, but just to try to clarify, the the, the uh, suggestion was we would be, well, first off, you're allowed up to four garage sales a year per rolling calendar year, each up to 72 hours in length. So enforcement would start on the 5th with an admin citation of 100 and 200. Uh, I'm sorry, the 5th would get a warning. 6th okay. and 7th would get an admin cite of 100 and 200. And then if they didn't... Um, still comply with that, that's the extent of the enforcement we would go, we wouldn't go any higher than that. This also covers signs or is that a separate Signs, like business signs? Uh, leaving garage sale signs or any other oh, signs. Um, Girl Scout oh, signs. 
Don't, don't, don't give it a load. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Until next question. month. I don't know the answer to. In the garage sale portion of the ordinance, how does it or does it address garage sale signs? It doesn't. That's temporary. So there is a different area from enforcement that Lane and his people will go out and, and you know, Lane even has a special tool he invented for taking off snipe signs, as we call them, from poles and that sort of thing. But separate from this ordinance. Not the temporary signs are illegal in the right of way, really pretty much in any event other than political signs for campaigns. If they leave their, if they have a garage sale and leave their sign out and don't take it down, that's a separate. Yeah, and we just take it and eliminate it. We wouldn't cite them or try to track them down or anything like that. Good with that. There's a house in my neighborhood that has garage sales along summer long. Yep, there's one on 48. The same. And, and the challenge I'm assuming is that code enforcement doesn't go out every Saturday, and so we have free rain. We have on call people uh, that can go out every Saturday, so that's a that's a misperception. So, but you're getting called in, and um, the level of enforcement to which we would want. There's the question. Like I was just saying, in this situation. Um, you know, you'd have up to five and you'd never have a problem. You'd have a sixth and a seventh. You'd have an admin site for first 100 and then 200. And then we'd not do anything else for the rest of the day. Code enforcement could drive by this house every Saturday from May until September and there'd be a, a garage sale. Well, that's what I'm saying. On the 8th and 9th and 10th and yeah. then on weeks, they wouldn't do anything. They still do it in August and September. So, so I'm just asking you, what yeah. would you like? So they Is have at least 12 to 15 a year? Uh, yeah, and, I mean, honestly, yeah, I don't know if code enforcement even if they've driven by. I don't know. I don't know. So, this is how they would enforce that in that circumstance. So, is that okay, or do you want more? Um, I, uh, I mean, Scott brings up a good point. If you want more admin sites on the process on the you know eighth and further, that would be the, the point of discussion, right. Well, and I was always under the impression since I moved in that you could only have three a year. So I'm good with going down to three. But how do you, I mean, I can drive past my, the guy on 48th and take a picture every weekend. And then when it gets to five call, or do you call every weekend and say, this is where it is? Yeah, you'd have to call because we're not bringing somebody out just to drive around and look for right. garage sales. So that's the... Letting people know if you see more than three or four, then start calling in or call every time you see one. So that do they have to record all four before they get to that fifth one? Yeah, they'd have to. So it wouldn't be us. Not unless, and not an individual right, right. would not, be able to take a picture and send it in. Yeah. What do you call it? Time stamped. So it pretty much would be basically just on complaint. You're right. We're not yeah. out proactively looking for garage sales. But like Scott says too, there's particular properties over time that become more chronic that you get aware of. With our neighbor, when they started bringing in truckloads of mattresses, we put on their garage sale every week. We just took two or three pictures in a row. Two weeks in a row? This week, this week. And I just text them to blame. That's what I'm asking. Do you want that or do you want oh, an enforcement yeah. officer to go out? That's why I say it's no. time stamped picture. Right. Sent to yeah, somebody at the city. Work. That's what I was asking. Okay. So I did wasn't very clear. Things. Yeah. <laughs> just here's the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the right. third, fourth. Because I agree. Pulling somebody in just to go look at them. But I don't know. <laughs> I know where my problem one is. Scott knows where his are. But how many more are there around the city that? I think it goes back. Did you mention it? Yeah. Somebody mentioned it last week or the week before that, you know, if we have coverage, code enforcement coverage on the weekends, I don't know. we know of a few places they can drive by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had like else. a list that Scott's mentioned the one they, uh, Address oh, a neighbor, and somebody else knows another one, and they had the list they were checking. Yeah, I'm sure they can do that. Because do we have a code enforcement employee that drives around every Saturday, or only on call? I it's not. It's more on call, right? 
Yeah, there are there's somebody available. There is somebody there. Available. Yeah, there's usually some of the supervisors who are also actual code enforcement and they're actually on premise, but they're usually doing case work, following up paperwork, that sort of thing. And then in addition to that, you have somebody on call that we could send around and do that. So there is somebody okay. actually around, present, available in either one of those senses. But yes, to the point, from an understanding standpoint, or do we have somebody there that would be available to just go drive around the neighborhoods and look for garage sales? No. Okay, that's the clarification. I, uh, I personally think we need to have a law enforcement and fellow with Scott need to be out. Because not only the yards sell, but also for the car auto shop and stuff like that, but they came here last week and mm. I think a few weeks ago, um, actively engaged. Can you do any repairs on the yeah. driveway or? Okay. You know, everything between. Is three garage sales enough? We lower it down to three? I think three is plenty. That's just me. I don't. I mean, if you get too many more than that, then it's a business. You need business license. Yeah. Spring. So, should we lower that to three? And then, so if they're nip, so then at four, they would get a warning. At five, they get charged $100. At six, $200. And you want to just keep going up to 52 or the 100? $100 increase until 52 weeks. I mean, I don't know how much you make off a garage sale and it would be profitable to have a garage sale with a penalty of 100 or 200 or 300. I've never had one. I don't know how much you make. I don't know. Anybody can enlighten. I think it, it makes more sense to, to continue to cite them after the, the seventh. Yeah. And if and if they continue after that, then I guess the two hundred dollars isn't the you want to just cap it at two hundred and then if they have a seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, it's just two hundred each time. Double every time. Well, yeah, I'll go by a hundred or double or I don't know. I, I guess if, if they continue doing it after seven times, that that that, that two hundred dollar fine is not working. It's not that we want to raise more money, but we just want compliance. Yeah. Well, and that's why I don't know if the lower amounts are enough to deter them. And maybe some, $100 is enough to say, oh, no, no more. Yeah. I think, at, like Don said, after four, <clears throat> they're, they're using it as a business. Mm -hmm. So. Well, and I know the one on 48th is definitely, that's their mindset and everything. It is a business for them. Start bringing in stuff. Stuff. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Trail by the trailer load. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all agree it was a business. Please don't come. And they had signs up saying, please don't park in the neighbor's driveway. But, you know, they were both in Spanish and English. I don't think the people coming to read either language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just parked wherever. Okay. Wide driveway. So, without a vote, just nodding. Do you want to move it down to three? I'm good with three. Good with three. Okay. The okay. three will change the three garage sales permitted. What about the past, which would now be five and six? Yep. So, five. four would be a warning. Five, six, seven, eight, uh, whatever. You want to cap it? You want it to keep going up? Wayne, that would take an ordinance change. Sorry. Right. Yeah. That's four in the all ordinance. Of it so, no, no. Not no, all of this all will of take it. ordinance. Okay. Right. Well, you haven't heard my last thing yet. So, okay. <laughs> I, th I think it, we at least ought to find for every other violation for the rest of the year. So but do you want to go up or you just cap it at? 200. That's why I'm like, I don't know what the profit margin where it stops it. So, when we have the machine out of our garage, we that big a profit. Now, that's 
Well, and for the person that's doing that wants to clean out their garage or the basement or whatever, but the ones that are actually turning it into a business. Well, you're talking the sixth or seventh garage uh -huh. sale of the year. Right. They've already had a warning and two other fines. Mm -hmm. Five hundred dollars for every every just capital five hundred after that. So one hundred, two hundred, then five hundred every time. So that's three garage sales, one warning, one hundred dollar fine, one two hundred dollar fine, and then five hundred each after that. Yeah. Is that right? What you're saying? That's okay. what I'm saying. Five hundred is good as number as any, I guess. <laughs> That's pretty arbitrary in my It is. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, I walked in late. This is pertaining just to residential properties, Correct. right? Yeah. So businesses that want to do a sidewalk sale or others, that's different. But is yeah, that's a little different. Somewhere in the code, are we, <clears throat> and sorry, yeah, you probably already addressed this, but like vacant properties where folks just pop up and not their own property, but they're bringing their stuff to sell. We see this all the time in that the Veterans Memorial Park on 47 South or the corner of 48th West and 47 South, that, mm -hmm. you know, these fields. So how do we, what do we do with that? So can we put in the There's ordinance that, that if you have an, let's see, if you don't own the property, then you're just cited right away. That's trespassing. Okay. Would no, that be? Okay, so but, that's. But something along that line, because a lot of times what happens is we'll go do something like that for that or a different reason. Mm -hmm. And the owner will say, oh, no, I'm fine. I want mm -hmm. you to trespass him. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But we actually did do a lot of work on this very subject last uh, summer. And the issue isn't, from our <clears throat> standpoint, isn't the ordinance or the um, authority under the ordinance to enforce. It's more of a coordination issue because you can't really just send out CO. Oh, guys, and you, and, and you can't really just send out a police officer because sometimes it's hard to tell where they are in the right of way. Is it private? Is it public? Yeah. Uh, what is the business owner's perception? Are they supportive? What kind of sale is it? Because there are some that are uh, actually legal. The, the usual delineation is can't do it unless you have the owner's permission and a permit and it's 20 feet back from the right of way line. If it's like a city park, county park, that's already not allowed. That's right? easy, right? Yeah, that's yeah. already not allowed. But even there, we what we what we ended up doing was we started taking a COP officer or a different police officer and a code enforcement officer and basically going around on a once a month or more as needed weekend basis so that you couldn't really kind of play the one against the other. The other example mm -hmm. of that on a, on a more daily basis is the guy who has the illegal vehicle. Yeah. out on the street, they move it to the yard, then they move it back to the street, then the police come back, we move it back to the yard. So it's kind of that dynamic, but now you've got both of the, the functions represented. So again, obviously we don't have the staffing to do that every Saturday. Because it's not a patrol officer, it's going to be a COP officer, and they got to kind of coordinate that with the code guys. But that's what we had started to do in that particular instance. I guess that's just more of us reporting or encouraging other people to report as they say. Right, right, exactly. Which I'll confess seems a little hypocritical because I bought oranges from that dude on 48 and I bought <laughs> right, right. Valentine's flowers outside the you know Maverick, like not all right. the time. But and then cold. Right. Very, and then cold. That's terrible. No, You're very, very kind. <laughs> I just drive by so, and call Angel with the address. The that are like every Sunday, all the time, yeah. and there's tons of cars, and you know, those are the ones I really I think that, that corner of 48 West and 4700 South is actually like 4715 South. Yeah. That very corner is not in our city. Isn't it current? Yeah. yeah. Right. Current. Current. Right. Yeah. So sometimes you do have those issues. Yeah. Yeah. But here, isn't something like that, though, covered in our <clears throat> can handling ordinance is partly yes. Yeah. So for right, right. Street. So if you were sitting in the median on one of the streets that's in that right. ordinance, then yeah, you're already automatically wrong, selling flowers or whatever. 
even sitting on the side of pull over yep. and buy the flower. I just, so I just use the median yeah. example because it's more glaring, right? So but yes, yeah, so on the sidewalk on the side as well. The median of firefighters on the yeah, I wish we kind of, we had to outlaw that. Yeah, that's we had to not quit that much. the fire guys do that. Yeah, we have the same problem, uh, Audra Road. Every weekend, basically, it's in the summertime, and you can drive by and you can see this vacant land, nobody there. So, uh, a lot of the, yeah, so one on 28700 West. No, 28700 South, sorry. Divided tracks there. So, you can see there is Saturday and Sunday. Um, the owner of that. Two vacant lands is basically they are not here in somewhere in Salt Lake City, so they cannot control that. And uh, law enforcement can drive by and see that similar law. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time. Well, well let's judge clarifying the garage sale yep. back to that. So yep. we're gonna change the ordinance to third three garage sales allowed, 100 and 200 for the Fifth and six, morning on fourth. Sorry, skip yeah. that. It's 500 each violation above that. Oh, yep. indefinite. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. We only have two more, but we're out of time. So I'm prepared next week for noise and loud parties and then the notice explanation, if you have any. And then hopefully we just get through that really, really quick. And I still have one more thing, but I'll deal with that next week. Also, Ben and uh, RV trailer. And uh, us, and if, if they can come up and bring it up, something to us for last week, I think we can talk about it. So. Well, is that on the parking that we're voting on tonight? I think uh, we've got that part stroke. No, there's a uh, area we are. Uh, we are. It's kind of a code enforcement type thing. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, will, I will talk to them later. Okay. Yeah, figure out if it's code enforcement or. Or, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll figure out. I'll okay. figure out. Yeah. yeah, figure it out, and then we'll talk about that one as well. Okay, so we're going to put off the 20 minute discussion for the form of government. Council calendar, anybody have an issue? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, potential future agenda item. We have a date, and we're going to bring it out over the end. Just so I looked at some note on nope. that earlier. Do you remember? That. Wait, I don't remember, yes. Oh, Nicole from above is talking. Oh, both Nicole, either Nicole. I'm I sorry. Um, we do yes. have a communication item scheduled next week to discuss uh, Dowdle. Okay. okay. Yep. There you go. I knew I'd seen a note. I just couldn't remember where. It's something we can solve quickly and we don't have to keep discussing. It's really just a question of where whether you want to fund it, right? Yep. Okay. And I can't remember. I'll look my notes. I can't remember if I had another question I needed answered. I think you know, he sent the contract, con, contract, he sent the back, and I you know, sent out to us, but I think only one or two of us responded, and so Nicole, so I brought it up last week, said, you know, nobody's responded. Okay. And I think that's still, my memory is we'd had two responses. Yeah. I think that's where we're at. So, yeah. Okay. So let's just have it back on communication and see if we get. To respond. We need to respond, we need to respond, through. Okay. Um, potential future agenda item is that? Anybody else? Mayor, I have two quick ones. That's right. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the mayor met with the World Mission Society Church of God Youth Group a couple weeks back. Um, they're a group of youth who are just actively doing things in our community, and the mayor thought it would be nice to give them a little recognition for their work at an upcoming council meeting. Um, just wanted to make sure if the council was okay for me to schedule that. And um, two Sundays ago, they had a blood drive, and then they explained their youth outreach program. And I'm like, um, that's my hometown in your little group. So they go around and fix up people's yards, plant or paint, plant, do whatever they need to. So I know. Well, I they think they've been doing it longer than us, but. Maybe. But they're worldwide and they do a great job. So that's why their youth group and it's run by their youth group. That's why I thought a recognition would be nice for them. Wonderful. Okay. 
So Hi, Nicole. Good. And then the next one. All right. And then the other request was from a resident who let us know that two West Valley City students um, who attend American Prep Academy and live in our city became National Merit Scholar finalists. So there's a yearly average of about 15 students from Utah each year that receive that designation. And two of those this year are from West Valley. So she was wondering if the council would like to give them a recognition. So, so why don't we ask Granite District Tunes if there's any that you know, have received that from their school. Okay. Would districts. you mind reaching out to? Aaron? Well, oh yeah, Granite School District itself though, and just asking about our schools. With that though, do you want students, no matter which Granite school they go to, or just West Valley High School students? If they live in West Valley, no matter what school they go to, right? We've got four high schools that feed from West Valley. Okay. Do you mind doing that, Nicole? Absolutely. Okay. And Skyline. Yeah, there's, yeah, that's why I'm wondering if it's just, that's why I'm asking. I don't think we've got any going up to Park City, but yeah. I don't have to look at his trunk next time. There might be one in the trunk. All right. Thank you, Nicole, for that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Any council reports? Thank you. Uh, the audit committee met uh, last month. And uh, you might remember from June of last year where we, the council approved the funding for an, a, another year of, of audit work. Um, and uh, there was a, there was some concern about having the same provider do our audit services. So this year, the audit committee um, sent out a request for proposals. We got three back. One was late and really incomplete. So we really had two responsible bidders. And the audit committee met last month to review these uh, bids. and. Uh, and we had a unanimous decision to accept the bid from our current uh, provider. And uh, there were several reasons for that. If you'd like, I can go through those. In June, we're gonna have this come up again to the council to approve paying for them. And we just wanna make sure right now that if, if anyone's gonna have trouble with that, that we should we should give the, committee that guidance right now so so that it can be put in the works to change that if they were the best responsible then yeah were there any glaring reasons that you wouldn't pick the other end yeah you want to so uh one thing was that the Pennington and Christensen they are they have their headquarters in West Valley City um they are uh, they, they agreed to be responsive between audits. The other organization is kind of if, if we have time and, and we'll charge you extra at our hourly rates if you have questions between audits. There was a significant difference in price, 162,000 versus 102,000. Um, if, if there's if there's what is it, it was 104 versus 165,000. Is that what you said? I, I said 164. Oh, 164 versus 102. I heard 104. Sorry. Yeah, 164 right. for the one that we didn't accept or didn't vote to approve versus 102,000. And then if there's any other services, their their hourly rates are twice as much. For, for the other company. There's, there's good reasons for staying with one. There's good reasons for changing as well. But uh, with Kennington and Christensen, they, they will rotate who, who audits our, uh, our organizations. And um, was something else that I was going to say, but now it just left me. But uh, got the staff. Yeah, the other company also had the staff. In fact, if you wanted to compare sizes of staff, the other company is is, is bigger. Um, 
But uh, Kennington and Christensen, they provide services for a lot of the municipalities in Utah. The other one only provides for Salt Lake City, and then the, most of their services are, are out of state. There's not very many companies who can do an audit of our size. And, and that's why we didn't get a lot of responses. Um, there, there's other organizations that audit the auditors and, and Kennington and Christensen definitely participates in that. And, uh, and, and our audit committee of the people who were there, we were unanimous. It was, it was a no brainer that we should go with Kennington and Christians. You know, just from what you said, uh, mosquito abatement, we hired an auditor last year, one that we ended up accepting was from Austin, mm -hmm. and the auditor was in, in that area too, and it made it difficult for them the auditor to get down to our location to do the audit. Yeah. So we did a lot of it. We've done a lot of things by Zoom. Yeah. But uh, it's not the best way to do it when you're trying to look at books. Right. Wayne, you were in that meeting, and, and Jim, anything that you want to add? There were two other things I thought that were of interest. Uh, Cuttington guaranteed their price for three years. The other oh, did yeah. not. That's right. I forgot about that. And another item was my personal um, evaluation. I believe the other firm underbid the amount of time and hours that they were going to do it. They, they said they would be able to do the audit for 100 hours less out of about 1,100 hours than Jensen and Keddington did. I don't believe that's realistic, which means they would be then coming back next year and, and charging a higher price, almost inevitable. Right. And Keddington and Christensen has been, and they've been uh, charging us the same price every year for many years. And they, and they figure that, that uh, in a second and third year, they're able to to reduce their their costs. As, as they provide that service. Jim, anything else? Um, you know, I think that's a significant point. They they understand the municipal auditing. They have, I think, somewhere around thirty different clients. They are probably the most prolific municipal auditor in the state. Well, they are by a long shot. Uh, and then um, they have a very robust peer review program where actually other audit firms come in and they audit their work and issue an opinion on it. That's through all, all the audit firms. It's a standard form of practice. They pass those uh, satisfactorily. They're also examined by the state auditor's office as to the quality and their compliance and they have they have passed all of their reviews. So uh, I didn't see any, any negatives in that. Okay. Being no other comments, I'll take that as a affirmative move we'll forward. Forward with our. Yep. Okay. Yep. Hey, okay, thank you. Was there anybody else at a council report? Oh, I don't have uh, one, but I have a comment. Um, actually, is, uh, I need to have the CAP meeting. Uh, Maggot Peterson, I believe, her group is going to be on. April 19 at 2 30 p.m. and I to look at my schedule and that I my kids I gotta pick up my kids so I cannot be here in a meeting. So any one of you wants to do that. What's the day and time? Sorry. Um, April 19, uh 2 30 p.m. Right that here. is a Wednesday evening. Yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday afternoon. Afternoon, right here. Yeah. So we here at 2 30. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Jake, thank you. Okay, we'll um, skip on the strategic discussion and we don't have a need for a closed session. No, ma'am. Okay, one more motion. Thank you. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Aye.